So my name is Michael, and I'm really sorry that I occasionally talk really quickly, especially for the interpreters. I'm really sorry for making your work hard. And so today I'm going to be talking about a lot of different stuff, but I'm going to focus on the idea of value, and I want to challenge your thinking on it. So I'm going to discuss how our current value framework is a problem and how this has limited our capacity to do good. And then I'm going to share some ideas on how we might go about changing this. So many designers are good people, us here, and many of us see things like inequality and ecological destruction as big problems. But solving those problems are never going to make for an impressive quarterly profit. So we never seem to prioritize them or get to work on them. So instead, we find ourselves prioritizing solutions that make or save money. And we often think of this as just being the way that things are. But is it really the natural way of things? Or is it something that we can challenge? Now, we tend to think of design as a thing that solves problems within constraints. But what if the constraint is the problem? What if that understanding of design constrains our thinking and encourages us to accept the world as it is? Because why can't we work full time on mitigating climate change, on solving the housing crisis, poverty, to help the 20 million people around the world right now who are at immediate risk of starvation? That's like New Zealand has five million people, I think. That's four times over. Now, if our work as human-centered designers is about solving real problems, then why are so few of us working on real problems? Now, those problems, they don't make money. They aren't profitable problems. We assume they'll be solved by the market or economic development. So profit, it turns out, is actually more of an incentive than actively making the world a better place which makes you question our values as a society. And that's pretty problematic. Now, I'm going to start looking at this problem space through the lens of value. How do we define value? What's our current value framework? What does a valuable world look like? And is that how we're creating it in our day-to-day -day work? Now, two key ways that we can understand value is in terms of sociological value and economic value. Now, sociological value is ultimately about what is good, proper, or desirable in human life. Now, some people might value equality and harmony, while others might value prestige and competition. Now, these values are what shape our behavior and make us ask things like, is happiness what we desire, or do we reward greed? Do our individual interests come first, or should we consider other people equally? Now, these personal and cultural values are what justify or discourage our actions and the actions of others. Now, economics says that how much a thing costs represents its value. Traditional economics assumes that people try to maximize returns and minimize costs, something called economizing. Now, the global reach of Western culture has influenced daily life to the point that much of our activity is centered on economic value, and designers are no different. Now, we see this happen when we put forward meaningful solutions that solve real problems that we see, and they're rejected for solutions that make or save money. But we also see it in that we don't even get a chance to solve certain problems. We're often tasked with things like lowering barriers to consumption and smoothing service delivery, rather than radically approaching the real big problems that we see today. Now, writer and activist Audrey Lord said that starting with people at the core instead of profit can create very different solutions. Now, this seems simple, and we claim to do this all the time in human-centered design, but it isn't the result of our work often. And what we do is centered on business objectives and economic return. And the problem with that is that human life is social. It's not just economic. The world isn't made of numbers. We can't mes e easily measure things like, like atmosphere and purpose and meaning. 
So it's hard to frame them as having valuable investment returns. And that means that a lot of what actually matters to us isn't what we're in the business of producing, because they don't tend to be high-impact, high-value opportunities. So we experience a bit of a friction between what we actually value and what we're actually bringing into the world. And this is inherently a problem of our value framework. Now, this framework, it shapes how policies are written, why institutions are formed, how organizations approach problem solving, and it reflects how we ourselves rationalize. And there's a name for this thing that refers to our collective values and principles. And that thing is called modernity. It's a term sociologists and anthropologists use. And this is the, the value framework that has shaped the modern world and defined Western society. Now, modernity is about capitalism, individualism, consumerism, and rationalism, things we all perpetuate as designers. And some core features of modernity include industrial and capitalist economies, where we organize ourselves around machines for efficient mass production to enable ever-increasing profit and consumption. Now, rationalism is another one, where activity is based ever-increasingly on scientific conduct instead of emotion and tradition. And individualism, where individual pursuits have become more important than the rights of groups and communities. Now, in action, this value framework, it looks like technological upscaling for the sake of it. Think digital transformation for everything. <laughs> Fetishizing growth, profit, and efficiency over social well-being and ecological health. It pressures us to be faster and more productive instead of doing things slowly, emotionally, and for purely experiential value. It looks like a society of competitive individuals instead of cooperative social groups. And it looks like us believing that doing all of these things will lead to a better, more just world. And we've come to see these, all of these things, as inherent indicators of progress but are they? Now, the new optimists are a collection of thinkers who suggest that, yes, the world is better now than it has ever been because of things like modernity. Now, they support this by pointing to things like a lower percentage of people living in extreme poverty, lower rates of child mortality, and higher rates of electricity access around the world, all important things to notice. Now, writer Oliver Berkman, he critiques some of their rather absolute claims. He agrees that, yes, some things are better than they were, especially if you use the plague and the world wars as reference points. But things are definitely nowhere near as good as they ought to be. We shouldn't be satisfied just because we aren't dying from war and disease, especially when many people around the world still are. Especially when, more importantly, we could have eliminated famines, reversed human-induced climate change, and greatly reduced human suffering and ecological damage. But we haven't. And that's because we focused on doing other things and had too much faith in the promises of capitalism. Now, it hasn't been a valuable experience for everyone, and there are many measurably bad things that show this. There are more displaced people in the world than ever before, more slaves today than ever before. Real wages have been flat or falling since 1979, while company profits have increased and wealth has become more concentrated amongst a few individuals. And even middle-class white American men, who are supposed to have benefited the most from all of this, are dying younger for the first time in decades due to suicide, substance abuse, and chronic disease. And this is due to those harder-to-measure things, like decreasing mental health, the loss of meaning, and increased uncertainty. And we design these things into being when we think of profit and modernization as solutions to all problems. So the value framework of modernity isn't inherently valuable. We only need to look to things like the social sciences to see examples of how this is actually the case. My first example of this is from behavioral economist Dan Ariely. And he gives a story about a locksmith. So as an apprentice, this locksmith struggled to fix locks, and he often broke them. 
And now despite this, his customers appreciated his work and gave him monetary tips. Now that he's an expert locksmith, he works quickly, precisely, and without effort. But instead of being more appreciative, his customers complain about what it costs for just a few minutes of his time, even though he doesn't charge any more than he did as an apprentice. Now, Ariely says that the value of the locksmith's work is about visible effort, not just the outcome. So there is a social element to how his work is valued, but it's also about efficiency. The more efficient he is, the less valuable his work seems to be. Now, the economic view of value is that increased efficiency and productivity, all things we aim for, are good things because more production and less waste equals greater wealth. But that's not necessarily how it's valued in a social sense. In social terms, we might actually do better to link efficiency and value together in a somewhat inverse relationship. So as efficiency increases, the social perception of that valued work is actually decreasing. So my second example is from Bridget Jordan, an anthropologist who examined childbirth in low-technology Mayan culture and high-technology hospitals. Now, in Mayan childbirth, the source of knowledge is the woman. People read the tension in the ropes that she pulls on for support. What she says and how she acts are what determines the degree of intervention and assistance. Now, the source of knowledge in high-technology hospitals comes from machines and technicians whose job it is to medicalize and mechanize delivery from increasingly passive women. Now, crucial information in that kind of context comes from procedures, results, and machine outputs that are interpreted by technicians and specialists instead of collaboration based on the woman's embodied knowledge. Now, high-technology childbirth is the manifestation of efficiency and objectivity. It seeks to move away from emotion and tradition to science and technology. Now, as designers, we commonly upscale technologically because we believe it's progressive and empowering. But Jordan discusses how doing things like that, especially in this scenario, can disempower and devalue women in childbirth by shifting their power to others. And that's the kind of cost that no one really thinks about. So my last example is from my own PhD work, where part of my doctoral thesis explores health service encounters in Seychelles. So, as part of my thesis, I explore and, and contrast the meaning and value of the public health system with that of grigri, or witchcraft, which is performed by healers and witch doctors. Now, my partner and I were both doing our PhD fieldwork in Seychelles, and we had our first child there together. Oh, fucking cute. <laughs> and this allowed us to become immersed, very immersed in the, the public health experience. Now, the experience of the public health system contrasts pretty strongly with how healers approach well-being, especially where health is increasingly medicalized. Now, this over-medicalization in Seychelles has created a bit of an aversion to Western medicine. Public health care was very transactional and paternalistic. It had rigid, efficient processes based on the objectives of doctors, technicians, and institutions, rather than being holistic, democratic, and patient-centered. Now, the witchcraft service encounter that was drastically different. It facilitated all kinds of things like superstition, embodied knowledge, tradition, and emotion. Now, witchcraft is a valued contemporary practice in Seychelles, but it isn't logical, rational, or efficient in the same ways. People pay to see a witch doctor, in fact, when public health care is free there. So why would that be happening? Now, I argue that it's about conflicting ideas of value where what governments and institutions value doesn't always match what people find valuable and meaningful. Now, magic is about realizing one's intentions by acting on the world. How that's actually done doesn't really matter. It's not about efficacy or rationalism, as much as it's about mobilizing beliefs and intentions, because that's what's valuable about it. Now, the clients of witch doctors are motivated to follow advice because it's part of a ritual that leverages intrinsic motivations and makes people part of something greater. And that contrasts with public health care where the experience is that patients are actually active in their own betterment. They have few meaningful actions to perform. Now, the healthcare service focused on 
being modern, efficient and rational, and the outcome was a rather paternalistic and transactional experience. So witchcraft was the antithesis of that, and it's been a valued cultural institution for much longer than modern hospitals have. So modern scientific practice isn't inherently valuable, and we see that when people reject scientific knowledge all the time. This kind of behaviour shows us that emotions, tradition and experience can far outweigh facts and evidence when it comes to why we value things and why we do things. So dogmatically putting economics, efficiency, individualism, rationalism and profit at the centre of everything that we do isn't universally valued or beneficial, and yet it shapes everyday life. It becomes cultural and systemic, and it has hidden consequences. And we see this when we do things like reduce, mediate, and automate social interaction. Now, Hart and Negri social theorists have an incommunicado theory, which argues that media actually inhibits communication, so that we lose the affective and Atmospheric information like presence, touch, mood, emotion, sensations, effectively making connections less meaningful. So while doing this makes it easy to send high amounts of information, it can occur at the expense of meaningful interaction, and we need to be critically aware of how we might be helping that become the new normal. Now, former Google design ethicist Tristan Harris, he has plenty to say on the issue of using design to increase engagement. Now, he sees a fundamental conflict between what people need and what companies need, because what we design is always tilted in favour of the companies trying to get people to use their stuff. Now, much of our work as designers, he says, actually attempts to psychologically hijack people to get them hooked on what is offered. Now, the metrics that we use would call that success, but is it? Now, Erica Hall of Mule Design, she put it well when she asked if causing someone to delight in their own exploitation should be called good design. Now, our value framework, it can result in all kinds of things like systemic inequalities, things like gender inequality. Now, the raising of children, for example, it's clearly valuable, we know it is, but stay-at-home parents aren't paid for what they do. Now, we've conflated value with economic value, and we've devalued domestic work in the process. And the result is that women who do most of that domestic work have been disadvantaged systemically. And this results in the gender pay gap, the, in women retiring with less superannuation than men, which means that they're more likely to experience poverty in retirement. So imagine this very real scenario. A man and woman are in a relationship for 20 years. The woman was a stay-at-home parent for that time, the man was working full-time and growing his retirement fund. Then, the relationship ends on bad terms. The woman has no super, and she's fast approaching retirement age. Her ex refuses to split his super. She sees a whole range of issues, barriers to getting that to happen, hiring a lawyer and so on, and so understandably, she gives up. Now, instead, she has to work well into old age, to afford the increasingly privatised services that she increasingly will rely on. Now, this would probably be in a low-paid job because of her age, lack of qualifications, what is perceived to be a huge employment gap on her CV, when she was actually giving herself to the domestic sphere that our culture pressured her to prioritise. Now, we can pat ourselves on the back by acknowledging the women that do that work, but that won't change the systemic nature of inequality that is underpinned by our value framework. And when we prioritise things like profit-oriented production and what boosts the economy, we create the conditions for gender inequality, the loss of meaning and psychological hijacking, and that costs us our mental health and many, many other things. We aren't just complicit in creating these things, we actively perpetuate them through design. Now, Herbert Simon, he said that design is about devising courses of action aimed at changing existing conditions into preferred ones. So we think about how things ought to be, and we create the world accordingly. Now, I don't think many of us here believe that the world ought to be a place where the rich get richer while large numbers of people unnecessarily suffer, where we encourage 
exploitation and even think that being overworked is virtuous. Where we destroy the planet for meaningless consumerism and purposeless growth. So how do we go about changing this? How do we move from profit-based economies that dogmatically modernize and commodify everything to worlds of meaningful purpose-driven activity with fairness, sustainability, and social justice at its core? So in trying to figure that out, I've realized one thing, it's really fucking hard. And so I've come up with a simple solution. So not everyone's going to be keen on that idea, and I get it. Because these guys would hate that idea, right? And rightly so. I mean, they've been able to take advantage of a system that's let them exploit people to create a collective fortune of over a trillion dollars. Now think about that, a trillion dollars. Clearly it's a system that works, right? I mean, look at that diversity. <laughs> but for those of you not so keen my very simple solution, I've got some less exciting ideas, still very exciting ideas. So now there are many ways to approach the problem of our current value framework, and none of them are easy or straightforward, including my one. And so I chatted with other designers about how to do this, and our thinking is that it could be approached on three different levels. The first is about ethics at work. The second is about collective organized design unions. The third is about social change. Now that first level, design ethics at work, these are things that, at least in theory, you can use to ensure you do good ethical work. And here are some of its core themes. Do no harm, and do take note of all of these. Don't exploit and deceive people. Don't create unhealthy behavior. Practice diverse and inclusive design. Have diverse teams and design accessible and considerate things for diverse groups of people. Consider social and ecological costs. Put people and the planet at the center of your work and prioritize things like well-being, equality, sustainability, rights, and privacy. Consider unintended consequences and take responsibility. Critically engage with how technologies might be used. Adopt the precautionary principle. Actively shut down unethical work when you see it. Refuse to do bad work. Don't work with shitty clients. Don't do shitty things. Now, these themes are from Mike Montero, Indy, the Copenhagen letter, and many others. And we can use these themes. They're very important to try and apply in our everyday work. But I have a critique. It's a constant struggle to do good ethical work, to apply frameworks like these. And that's because we're always working against KPIs, key decision makers, policies and structures that encourage, quite frankly, inequality, exploitation and xenophobia. And that won't change. No matter how much we try, we have to try as individuals, but the fundamental structures of our societies are going to fight against us until those change because they are also biased. We have to ground ethics and purpose in everyday practice, but there's more that we need to do to make it work, to make it be effective. And that brings me to the second level. We can make ethics every day more effective by forming collectives and unions. That dirty word. Now, I'm not sure about New Zealand, but unions are framed as the devil in Australian politics, and that's because they work. Now, check out this graph on unions and income share. Wealth distribution improved as unions grew when unions diminished, inequality rose. Now, I know it's a lot more complex than that, but there is a pretty strong relationship between people power, otherwise known as democracy, and income equality. Now, unions are effective at protecting workers and fighting for their rights and interests, and we can benefit as designers from doing the same. There's this scene in Planet of the Apes where one ape holds up a twig and he snaps it in half. And he holds a bunch of twigs together. They bend, but they don't break. Now, this scene makes a simple, important point. We're more effective together. Individual wills are easier to break than collective movements. And we need to establish altruistic bonds of solidarity together through organized design collectives to be effective. These can support and protect designers to address the destructive and unethical conduct that we see and we face. 
and they'll advance design ethics with collective pressure, collective demands, and collective action. Because creating design collectives is an important step in creating meaningful change that is broad and effective. But we can build on this even more, which takes me to level three. Now, there are many people who fight for equality, who struggle for fair and sustainable futures. And we need to join them and see that this is bigger than our work as designers. And we need to build a collective design movement, but we need to then connect it to other movements. This is the way that we approach the big problems that don't make profit, the ones that our employers and clients aren't in the business of solving. Because we can refuse to do shitty work, but that doesn't mean that shitty work won't happen. Will designers not working for weapons companies halt weapons production? Of course not. We need to do far more. And that's because the ethics at work approach is a bit like the design equivalent of ethical consumption, where it's the individual's responsibility to reduce impact by green and save the world. And of course, our habits matter. They're important. That's how all this manifests. But we shouldn't focus just on individuals at the expense of the pressure that we do need to put on governments, institutions, and organizations, because they are much better positioned to spearhead that work. They define what we work on. And their agendas are way too often perpetuating the problems that we see. Now, our value framework drives us to mindlessly technologize and commercialize. Capitalism does create inequality by design. I know the technicals of this, so we can chat afterwards if you disagree. But our fundamental roles as designers won't change if these paradigms don't change. Now, we need to take part in struggles that imagine other ways of being and knowing and seek to do away with the destructive growth first paradigm. Now, here in New Zealand, Wanganui River, being given personhood is an amazing achievement and exactly the kind of reframing that we need to shift direction and undo the damage of capitalism and colonialism. So get behind Maori struggles and the kinds of people making this stuff happen. But don't stop there. Get behind all kinds of struggles against systemic racism, things like Black Lives Matter, and to fix the system that's imprisoning the most vulnerable at record rates, like black people in the US, indigenous Australians, but also Maori people, who are 15% of New Zealand's population, but more than 50% of the prison population. Get behind queer and trans folk, queer and trans teens, youth, have some of the highest suicide rates. Support them so that suicide is no longer seen as a safer option than living. Now, get behind women's struggles for so many reasons, but even just so women can control their own fucking bodies, right? Not be taxed for being women. I mean, to tax sanitary products and subsidize Viagra, what the fuck? Like, talk about fragile masculinity and worshiping the phallus. Like, get behind struggles for differently abled folk who depend on things that we take for granted sometimes. Because funding cuts for access to social services, things like that. They're always on the agenda. There always seems to be money for war. Now, there are so many problems that we should be prioritizing, but we aren't. We should be pouring our efforts into redesigning systems for equity. We need a paradigm change for that to happen. Innovation needs to include political innovation. Because if we care about the stuff that we say we do, we need to get behind movements for things like social equity, rights, sustainability, autonomy, and social transformation. We can't separate these struggles from what we value as designers. And to do this, check out things like the Leap Manifesto, the Design Justice Network, and Nick Cernicek's Inventing the Future for some great thinking on what a different future could look like and how we might get there. Because we're in the middle of a transformational shift. We see Trump, we see the rise of fascism, we see war, we see climate change, we see rising inequality, we see the threat of famine to millions of people around the world. This is real, this isn't cliche. And I don't want to downplay the amazing things that we do, but we are also kind of ignoring the horrific things that are happening. We are in the middle of quite a horrific chapter and we need to change how it's being written as designers, but more importantly, as people. But to do this, we have to imagine radically different futures. 
Now, cultural theorist Mary Zunazi said that if we follow probability, there is no hope, just a calculated anticipation authorized by the world as it is. Now, we deny ourselves the hope of a different world when we accept human-made things like policies, KPIs, politics, business objectives, and economies as constraints. Now, if we continue to think this way, we'll only ever imagine what the current paradigm deems permissible. Maybe the incremental practical steps that we take are moving along fundamentally flawed terrain. Maybe we need to think about a different kind of groundwork. Consider that the future doesn't need to be futuristic, shiny, and exclusive to be meaningful and valuable. We don't need to be competitive and individualistic to make a world that matters. Economic value doesn't define what is valuable and meaningful. Because we need to remake work ourselves and our societies so that we're designing better futures every day by default. So to sum up, here are some things that we can do immediately. First, join How Might We Do Good. This is what Ash was talking about yesterday. So that we can start a design movement that matters. Send an email to that address or head to my Twitter page and join through the pinned tweet. Because a lot of what I've shared today, everything I've shared today, needs to be critiqued. It's absolutely not the answer. It's just an idea. It needs to be refined. It needs to be built upon. Because this is a place for us to do that and work out ways to put them into action. Then find and apply design ethics frameworks from the likes of Mike Montero, Indy, the Copenhagen letter. Identify what the barriers to applying these frameworks are, and then use those other approaches to build on them. Strengthen these approaches, then, by forming design collectives to create collective pressure, collective action, and achieve far more than we ever could on our own, together. And that's something that we can formalize in the Slack group. And then get behind social and political struggles. Find what you're passionate about and be vocal. Connect your passion as a designer to other people's struggles so we can fight for better futures together. Now, I know that's a lot of information to take in. And it might seem as a bit of a, a, bit of a downer, a bit full of negativity for some people, but I beg you to think about the people that are experiencing some of the things that I shared and don't go away and try and find something positive to, to hide it. See this instead as an opportunity, as a call to action. If you feel mad or upset by some of the things that I spoke about, use that energy, drive it into something meaningful and radical to create change, because we can be the drivers of that change, because we're empathetic, motivated, passionate folk, and we can do that. We're designers. We're tasked with making the world. Let's make it better. Thank you.